We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church family. Great to see you, the 10 o'clock service. Glad to see you all here. We're in week five of our series called Unshakables. If you're wondering kind of what is this series about, I'll give you a, a good word, uh, kind of a picture, right? Open up your hand for me, right? If your hand's open like this, things can kind of come and go, right? But our, our unshakables, the, the essentials of our faith here at Arundel Christian Church are the things that we are close-fisted on. These are the things that we're not willing to give up ground on, when people disagree with us on these things, it's just like, you know, this, this dis- disagreement is too big because God's word is really clear about certain things that we understand regarding our theology, our doctrine of what it is that we believe. So throughout this summer, we're exploring those unshakables, those closed-fisted, the things that we know are true and that we're not willing to compromise on. Now, there's a lot of open-handed theology. There's, a, there's some non-essential matters You might think one way about end times and someone else might think something else. And that's okay for us to disagree on. But the things we're talking about throughout this summer, these are our our essentials of the faith. These are our unshakables. Today, we're going to look at, we've been talking about a lot of theology. Our our doctrine is basically like a version of theology. What do we believe about God? Today, we're going to look at anthropology. Have you ever heard that word before? Anthropology is a study of man. We're going to look at what does God's word say about who you are, about humankind in relation to who God is. In other words, we have to have an accurate anthropology in order to understand who we are in relation to our theology, our understanding of God. Because if you don't have an adequate biblical understanding of why you're here and and why you exist, and all the, the answers to those hard questions, then your understanding of God will be skewed, okay? So we're going to explore man today. Now, it's important because there's a lot of questions people might ask. Questions like, well, what am I here for? What is the purpose of human beings? Or what happens to a man or a woman after they die, right? Or certain questions like maybe, um, where, where did man come from? Where did we all come from? Now, these are all questions that if you answer these questions from God's word, you're going to get a specific, a specific and important understanding of, of God, uh, our anthropology that's going to point to who God says that we are. It's going to improve our theology. But if you just go to the world to answer these questions, they're going to give you some really weird answers that aren't going to help you understand God and your relationship to him at all. And so with that in mind, we're going to explore the, 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 the church's understanding of who God says that we are. If you go to our website and you go to what we believe and you use that drop down to our essentials of the faith, you're going to see the statement. Let me put it up on the screen. This is a big idea statement of what this church believes about man. Let's read this out loud together. You ready? Here it goes with me. Man is made in the spiritual image of God to be like him in character. He is the supreme object of God's creation. Although man has tremendous potential for good, he is marred by an attitude of disobedience toward God called sin. This attitude separates man from God. Now here's the issue with that statement. That statement, I believe, is true. It's, it's one of the things that I, I believe is an essential matter of faith. But this statement was written by man. You know, we got, you know, a group of elders together, and we, we wrote out these essentials of the faith. And so this is a man-made statement. Uh, but the good news is, is today we're going to explore God's Word. What does God have to say? And how can we see the, the validity of this statement up on the screen? So we're going to explore that together this morning. Let's, let's go to God in prayer and ask him to reveal to us what he wants us to see. God, we thank you so much for revealing 
the truth about who you are in your word. And you also reveal the truth about who we are in relationship to you in your word. Would you allow each of us to be able to see clearly this morning everything you want to point out to us? If you need to poke us or prod us or spur us or make us uncomfortable in some way to move us into truth, would you do that for us today? Help us to be open to becoming more like Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what we're going to do, what I, what I have when you read that statement, I think there's four kind of key truths to understanding uh, what I'd call unshakable truths about man, all right? Here's the first one. Uh, number one is that man is made in the image of God. Now, don't, don't miss this. This is unshakable. If somebody says, you know what, I, I believe in Jesus, and I believe in this, and I believe in that, but I don't believe that man is made in the image of God, I would say, whoa, hold on. I'm not willing to give up any ground on this because the Bible is crystal clear that humankind has been made in the image of God. Now, let's explore what that means. There's a, there's a Latin phrase I want you to all learn if you haven't already. It's called imago Dei. Can you say that with me? Imago, I-M-A-G-O, and then Dei, D-E-I, imago Dei. And what it simply means, it's this understanding, this truth that you have been made in the image of God, Imago Dei, the image of God. According to Scripture, if you're in this room and you're a human being, that's all of us, we have been made in God's image. Let me show that to you in Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. It says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. There you have God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit, right, all together, and they're saying, let us create man in our image. There's the first iteration of in our image, to be like us. It says, they will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. And so God created human beings, here it is a second time, in his own image, imago Dei. And then it says a third time, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. In just two short verses, it's crammed in there three times, church, that you, as a human, were made in the image of God. It's got to be important to mention it three times. What does that mean? Anybody scratching their head? Like, what does it mean to be made in the image of God. Well, according to Scripture, when God says, let us make human beings in our image, it then says, to be like us, to be like God. God designed you to be like him. Now, now don't miss this. God didn't create you to be God. He created you to be like God. A great visual of this would be like if you traveled to Italy and there was this, you know, you go to see the statue of David. Beautiful, right? There's incredible detail it's just incredible, uh, you know, what, what, it, it, is the statue David? No, it's a statue of David. You, you, you don't have David, you have something made in the image of David. Who knows how accurate it is, I don't know. But here's the truth, you're not God, you never will be God. There are other faith systems that believe that one day you might become a God. That's not what this means. You're not going to be God, you'll never be exactly God, but you have been created in his image to be like him. It's pretty powerful. Do you know not even the angels were created in the image of God? You, of all things that God made, were created in the image of God. And God has a will, and he has intellect, and he has emotion and he has these these different elements that we we acquired because God made us in his image these are things that we uniquely have that that nothing else in all creation experiences and and God created us in his image so what does this mean what are the implications that we should borrow from this truth that humankind has been made in the image of God let me let me give you a few implications from this i think probably the most important implication that we can all gather from this truth is that there is dignity and sanctity in every 
human life from womb to tomb. The moment that you have life, human life, you have something that has been created in the image of God, and therefore there is a dignity and a sanctity to that creation, and it is beautiful and wonderful and made in the likeness of God to be like God. You know, there's something really cool. I I, I want you to go look this up later this week. Go look it up on YouTube or something. Uh, When you take that moment of conception, we're talking the moment an egg and a sperm come together and create that that, that zygote, right? That first, uh, that that moment of conception. You get that, that moment under a microscope and the most amazing thing happens. Now, before I even tell you what happens when that happens, you know, the Bible says that God is light, And in him there is no darkness at all. And you get this moment of conception under a microscope, and there's this thing that happens that scientists can't explain. There's this quick emission of light, this little flash of light that happens, actual light that emits in the moment of conception. You see, in that moment, from womb to tomb, We have sanctity and dignity of life. Why? Because life has been created in the image of God. doesn't matter how small, how tall, what color hair, what color skin. None of that's what matters, right? It's the truth that all life, human life, has been created in the image of God. That's a very important distinction and implication. And what does that mean? It means as, as image bearers of God, we need to be very intentional Brothers and sisters, listen, we need to be very intentional about uh, protecting all human life from abuse and exploitation. When you recognize that it wasn't just you that was created in the image of God, the person across from you, that neighbor that bugged you, that coworker that you don't like very much, they were also made in the image of God. It's going to change the way you interact with other people. It's going to change the way you stand up for the rights of others around you. It's going to change the way you, you, you see exploitation and abuse and, and neglect that happens all over our globe. Why? Because people have been made in the image of God. You see, only God decides when life begins, and only God decides when life ends. Whether we're talking about abortion or suicide or euthanasia, all those things. Listen, those are, those are off the table when you understand that all life was created in the image of God and God decides when it begins and ends. Let me, uh, I don't need to go down this road, but I want to for a moment because I always like stepping on a few toes. Have you ever wondered like, what is the church, how do we approach the question of capital punishment? Have you ever thought about that? You know, someone takes someone else's life and They get the death penalty, and they end up losing their life. What does the Bible say about something like that? You know, we already decided that only God decides when life begins and life ends. But do you know God has made a decision about when life begins and life ends in the case of capital punishment? He says in Genesis 9, 6, if anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands, for God made human beings in his own image. Isn't it crazy? Scripture even has answers for some of those hard, difficult questions. So if you want to know my, my position on capital punishment, there you go. Roman, or Genesis 9, chapter, chapter 9, verse 6. Here, let me show you a couple other implications. If we believe that man is made in the image of God, I know I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this point than the others, uh, but a, a second implication that we see here is it says that God created man in his image, and it goes on to say, male and female, he created them. Like, why, why the extra little, little bit? I think he kind of threw that in there for our generation. Hey, in case there's some confusion. He created man in his image, male and female, two genders. Another implication I see in here it's really, I think, pretty important, is that if we were created to be like God, we were created in his image to be like him, then personal holiness must be a very important goal of ours. 
We have to recognize that we've been created in God's image to be like him. And so therefore we should pursue personal holiness with everything we have so that we can be like God the best way we know how. Listen, we're never going to get there. We're never going to be perfect like God, but we've been created to be like God. So why not give it all of our effort? You see, personal holiness is important. Listen, we say all the time in this church that God loves you, right? Everyone, everyone's heard that before in this church. If this is your first time, you're going to hear it for the first time. Listen, God loves you just the way you are. The moment you walked in here, whether or not you have a relationship with him, whether or not you're living in sin right now, whether or not you agree with me or you don't agree with me on the Bible, whether or not you care, whether or not you're even listening to me right now, I want you to know that God loves you just the way you are. Although we always take it a step further at Arundel Christian Church. We want you to know God loves you the way you are, but he loves you far too much to leave you that way. Because here's why. There's a version of you, there's an, an, a version of your life. We say God loves you the way you are. All of us, we have a way that we are, that we've made, that we've designed. This is who I want to be. This is what I like to do. I want to do things my own way. We have a version of us that we've created. And I want you to know, God doesn't love that version of you. He loves the version of you that he created, the image of God in you. He sees beyond the ver your version of you to his version of you, and he desperately loves you because you were made in his image. He designed you to be like him. I'm not talking about legalism here. You know, legalism is where we pursue, you know, doing the right thing and trying to earn our way to God, to earn God's good grace, right? None of us are going to be able to do that. What I'm talking here is, is obedience. It's where we act in accordance with the grace and mercy that's already been given to us. We ought to pursue honoring God with our lives, pursue personal holiness. Why? Because we were made in the image of God. By the way, this will change the way you see verses like Romans 12.1. Romans 12.1, if you're familiar, it's a verse that says that we ought to, in light of all that God has done for us, we ought to present our lives, our bodies as living sacrifices. Think about that from a new way. When you realize you've been made in the image of God, what it says now is because I've been made in the image of God, God created me to be like him. I've got his stamp on me, his signature on me. In fact, I've been made in his image, and therefore everything I have is God's. And so because of all that he's done for me, just the fact that he made me, I owe my life to him. He can have it all. So that's point number one. Man was made in the image of God. By the way, we normally have like fill-in-the-blank notes at ACC. I just got back from a trip to Nicaragua, so I didn't get my notes in on time this week. And so you're just having to write one, two, three, four. I got four points, all right? Here's point number two. Man was designed to glorify God. If you've ever wondered, like, what am I here for? Why did God put me on this planet? What is the purpose of humankind? It's very simple. It all boils down to this one truth that man was designed to glorify God. I love how in Psalm, if you have your Bible with you this morning, open up with me to the, the eighth Psalm. Because this Psalm so beautifully captures what we just talked about, that we were made in the image of God with the second truth that we were designed to glorify God. It says in the first two verses of Psalm 8, O Lord, our Lord. And by the way, these are two different lords that you're seeing here in Scripture. It's not a repetitive lord. This is, O Lord, as in O Yahweh, the name of God, and then a recognition that God is deserving to be followed. O God, whom I follow as Lord. O Lord, our Lord, it says, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. How does an infant tell of God's strength? Man, when you just look at a baby and you see those hands and those cute little cheeks that you just want to pinch, right? And you want to grab those toes and you just want to, like, you just look at a baby. 
And just the beauty of God's creation, this new image of God that's looking back at you, in that moment, God is glorified by the beauty of what's happening. And that, look what he did. An infant tells of the glory of God. Man was created, the, the, the God created you to, to glorify him. That the way the whole verse starts, oh Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. So let me, let me an- answer that question. What is the purpose? What is our purpose for being here? Now, a lot of us, we have other things we can do. You have a purpose, but you could accomplish other things on top of that. Like if you wanted, I could get a, a raw like T-bone, I had a steak and put it on my ironing board at home. I could turn my iron all the way up and I could cook you a steak. I could technically, it would probably take a while. I'd have to flip it a few times and I'd get that iron really pressed on there. And at the end of the day, you could go home and say, hey, Pastor Matt, cook me a steak. And it worked, right? But is that the purpose of the iron? No, that's not the iron's purpose. And so understanding your purpose, why God put you here, why God allowed you to be beautifully and wonderfully made. What was the point of it all? Now, you'll hear different pastors and different churches and kind of draw out this statement and kind of have a really beautiful explanation of the purpose of man. I've heard a lot of different versions of it. Let me, let me look at some of these for a moment. Did God create you to make him known throughout the earth? Yes. He wants you to, to take the gospel out to the far, uttermost parts of the earth, the farthest parts of the earth you can find. God created you to, to share his love with other people. Yes, that's absolutely a purpose that God has for you. What about this? Does, did God create you to love God and to love people? Does he want you to do that? Is that one of the purposes he has for your life? Yes, it is. Did God create you to enjoy him forever? to be in relationship with him and to enjoy his presence forever? Absolutely. He wants every single person in this room to have a a relationship with him and to enjoy him forever. That's part of the purpose. But if you think about really the, the, the boiling it down, each one of those, why does God want you to enjoy him forever? Why does God want you to love God and love people? Why do we want to make him known? You see, when we make God known, God is being glorified. When we love God, He's being glorified. When we love his creation, God gets glorified. When we enjoy God forever in relationship with him, it brings him glory. So at the end of the day, what is the ultimate purpose of man? It's to glorify God. God created us in his image to bring him glory. You need to understand that. Let me show you this. Go ahead and stay in Psalm 8 because we're going to go right back there in just a moment. But let me show you four passages of Scripture that really hit this point home so nobody can say, I was cherry-picking Scripture. Here, here it is, Matthew five sixteen. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Why do we want our light to shine? Why do we want to do good things? So God can be glorified. That's the ultimate purpose. How about this? Isaiah 43, 7. Bring all who claim me as their God, for I have made them. Why? For my glory. It was I who created them. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. says, whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do. Why do we do it? Do it all for the glory of God. Romans eleven thirty six. For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for what? For his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. You see, the purpose of man, one of the things we need to understand in our anthropology to have a proper theology is that we were made in the image of God and we were made to glorify God. We were designed for his glory. All right, here's the third unshakable truth that we're going to cover this morning is that man is the supreme object of God's creation. Man is the ultimate, the pinnacle, the, 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 the prime object of God's creation, that you are the supreme object of God's creation. Let's look at this back in Psalm 8, if we keep reading at verse 3. It says, When I look at the night sky, and when I see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you set in place... 
what are mere mortals, human beings, right? That you should think about them. Human beings, that you should care for them. Yet, you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals and the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims and in the, in the ocean currents. Everything! God has placed mankind as the supreme object of his creation. There's something special about you as a human being and that he's placed the authority of everything else he created. He put you over it. He's placed us in this authority position over everything else he created, the supreme object of his creation. Again, I remember telling you a few weeks ago that sometimes as a pastor, I get the question, uh, Pastor, do you believe in aliens? Have you ever wondered that before? Do aliens exist? I told you my answer that I usually give is I do believe in aliens. I believe that Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ in this room, you're called to be aliens. You're called to be strangers in this place. This is not your home. You're, you're meant for another place. You're meant for, you're just passing through these shadow lands for where you're meant to live forever with God in the new heavens and the new earth, right? This is not your home. We're, we're called to be like aliens. But I know when you ask me that question, that's not really what you're asking, right? You want to know, do you believe in like alien aliens, right? And when I read scripture, I understand that God created this earth and he created everything in it. And at the very end, he created mankind as the supreme object of his creation and that we are uniquely and wonderfully made in his image. Uh, my answer is no. I do not believe in alien aliens because I know that God put all of his energy in creating in his image something uniquely and wonderfully made and that's humankind right here on this planet, on this globe. Now, I think there's some implications to this truth. If you're like me and you believe that you are the supreme object of God's creation as a human, it's going to affect some of the ways that you have to live your life. All right, let me show you a few of these. One, you're not able anymore as a supreme object of God's creation to believe that you are the descendant of a monkey. You just can't. You didn't come about as an accident. You're not a, a distant relative, an amoeba, right? You're not that because you were created in the image of God as the supreme object of his creation, intentionally, beautifully, and wonderfully made. That's one of the implications that comes from this belief. Another implication is that we have to understand that we have God-given rights as human beings that aren't offered to others in the animal kingdom in the plant kingdom, in the fungi kingdom, in the whatever other kingdom. I skipped that day in science class. Here's another implication. Hey, you know, as the supreme object of God's creation, knowing that he's put us in charge of everything he's made, we are therefore entrusted with stewarding God's creation. We're responsible for taking care of and being responsible with all that God has made. That's an implication there. Here's another really cool implication, by the way, is that you as a human being are unique in that you have a soul. Nothing else that God made has a soul. You know, Scripture even says that the relationship that God has with human beings is so unique this idea of, of God sending his son to redeem human beings back to himself and the fact that we have this soul that can be saved and, and, and reconnected with God the Father, it's so unique that even the angels, according to Scripture, stand in awe at the relationship that God has with you and I. It's pretty amazing that angels sit there and scratch their heads in amazement at how much God loves us. All right, unshakable truth about man, number four. That man is separated from God by sin. Man is separated from God 
by sin. Now, normally when you're preaching a sermon, right, you want to end on a really encouraging, positive note. And this is probably like the worst bummer of a note somebody could land on. Hey, I want you to know that God's awesome, but you're separated from him because you have this thing called sin, all right? So here, that's point number four. We have to understand that truth in order to have a proper theology of what we're going to talk about next week. Next week, we're going to talk about sin, and we're going to talk about salvation, But the hard truth is, before you can understand sin, before you can understand salvation, you have to know that we are separated from God because of our sin. When I was in Nicaragua this past week, two of the days we were going to do ministry with this church that was in this very remote village up on a mountain in northeast Nicaragua. We had to drive an hour and a half by bus to get to like the the place where the bus couldn't go any further. Like the roads were now no longer passable by bus. And so our whole team, we had to get out and we had to pile into the back of two pickup trucks, like off-road style pickup trucks, heavy duty tires. And we had to stand in the back or sit in the back. Some of us chose to sit inside the actual, the, the boring ones, right? Decided to sit inside the actual truck. And we're like, all right, we're gonna go and we're gonna, we now for the next 30 minutes have to hike up this mountain via truck And part of getting up to this village was actually crossing two rivers in the truck, driving across the rivers in the truck. It's pretty awesome, okay? And so we're we're there on day one, we're doing ministry, and we've gone through the two rivers. It was pretty awesome. And, And then it starts to rain, and we're just wrapping up our ministry. Normally, we'd stick around, enjoy hugs and high fives and prayer and all sorts of stuff. But the leader of our trip said, listen, everyone needs to go get in the truck right now. We have to go right now. And I'm thinking, what, is there an emergency? Like, what's going on? She's like, just trust me. It's starting to rain. If it starts to downpour, you'll be sleeping here. Get in the truck right now. We got to go. Got a 30-minute drive. And simply what she was saying is there's a, there's a river, one of the two rivers. If it rains hard enough, we won't be able to drive the truck through it. And we'll basically be sleeping on this concrete slab without any food or water or bedding tonight. So if you want to go, you better get in the truck now. So we all got our stuff and we got in the truck. Let's go. By the way, let me pause for just a moment. I do have a reason for telling you that story. That same village, about halfway up up that mountain, there's there's another team, a ministry team, a missions team that traveled to that same people. They got there yesterday in Nicaragua. And they were traveling to that town in Nicaragua to help build another church. The church foundation has already been created, uh, but they're now putting the walls and the roof on it this week. The problem is it's been raining so much the last couple days that that team is stuck on the wrong side of the river. They have the supplies and the people, the plan, and they're stuck. So I'm going to pause for a moment. Let's say a prayer. Together as a church, that that water will clear up and that team can get to where they're called to be and that God will use them where they're at. And God, would you just do a a powerful miracle right now? Would you clean up and clear up the rain? Allow that river to, you know, to to go down, the water levels to to lower and uh, make it safe for the vehicles to, to cross and the supplies to cross. God, in the meantime, would you give that team divine appointments where they can be doing ministry where they're at right now? We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus, amen. Let me tell you why I tell you this story about this river. You see, when we believe and have a proper understanding that man is separated from God because of sin, it's as if man is on one side of the river and the waters are so high that it's impassable, that there's no way to get across to the other side where God is in perfect holiness. Because of our sin... We're stuck over here. The Bible says that God is light and in him there is no darkness. If God allows darkness across the river, then then everything's messed up, right? God doesn't allow darkness on his side of the river. And so there's this huge river, there's this huge ravine that separates us. There's no way for us to be in relationship with God. Man is separated from God by sin. You see, the only way across is if God himself create some sort of method or passageway that we can cross from one side to the other. In and of yourself, we don't have what it takes. We can't build a bridge. We can't do enough right things. We can't figure it out. 
We are separated from God because of our sin. We call that the bad news of the gospel. (laughs) Now, you've probably heard the gospel called something else, right? The good news. You see, the good news is that God doesn't want us stranded on the other side of the river. He doesn't want us stranded on the other side by ourselves. He wants us to be able to, to, to have this righteousness, this perfection that we need to be in relationship with him. He wants to be able to bridge the gap and create a way for us to get over it and into relationship with him. Next week, we're going to go into detail about that. We're going to talk about sin, why we're separated from God, and we're going to talk about the bridge that God has created to save us from ourselves. We call salvation. So I'm kind of going to leave you on a bad note today, just leave you hanging with the truth that you are separated from God because of your sin. Now, I get it. Some of you are going to be here this week, and you got vacation planned for next Sunday. And you're like, well, please don't do that to my neighbor I invited today. Please don't. Let me, tell you, let me tell you a small version of the good news. See, God loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to live on this earth. And Jesus came 100% man, experiencing all the same temptation and the uh, that is, you know, the, the opportunity to sin as you had as a 100% man, but he also was a 100% God. In him was perfection and righteousness, and so he never sinned. And because he was 100% man and 100% God, he was able to bridge this river for us. And by Jesus dying on the cross, Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can go across the river to God except through Jesus. And so through Jesus' death on the cross... And through his resurrection, he's made a way that anybody who wants to not be stuck on this side of the river can cross over and be seen as righteous and holy in the eyes of God. That's the good news. We're going to go into greater detail about that next week. The thing that we need to understand first, though, to have a proper theology is that man is separated from why? Why did God have to do something like that? It's because we are separated from God because of our sin. Let me show this to you in scripture, Romans 5, 12. When Adam sin, sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, and so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Romans three twenty three. for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Raise your hand real fast if you have never sinned for me real quick. Okay, that's what I thought. All of us, we inherited this problem from the garden. Adam and Eve, they ate from the tree they weren't supposed to. Sin, the knowledge of good and evil, entered into our experience. Our sin nature is now something we all experience. All of us, we can't just blame Adam and Eve. We all choose our own way constantly over God's. And this sin separates us from God because he is perfect and he is holy. In him there is no darkness. We have a problem Isaiah 59, 2 says, it is your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. That's the bad news. I hope and pray that you come back next week for the fuller example of the good news of the gospel. And here, here's the question we ask every, every week. We have an opportunity to, to pray to God and pray this three-word prayer. God, what now? What now? What do I do with this truth? Now that I, I understand more fully that I've been made in your image, what do I do with that? God, now that I understand that I was designed specifically to give you glory, I know I have other gifts and I have other talents and I have other things that I do and you, you call me to do other things, but ultimately all that boils down to My experience here is to glorify you. And now that you understand that you are the supreme object of God's creation, and now that you more fully embrace the truth that man is separated from God by sin, that there's nothing you and I can do in and of ourselves to be made right with God unless God intervenes in some way. What do we do with that information? Let me me challenge you with a thought. As you're asking God to reveal something to you right now, I want you to know that when God created everything, his creation, scripture says, points us to him. 
When we look at that little baby, we ought to, to see the power and might of, God's, of God. We look at the trees and the sunset, right? It's going to point us to God. And the whole, here's the cool thing. God wants us in relationship with him, so he sent Jesus. God points us to Jesus. God says, listen, I want to be in relationship with you, so I'm going to send my son, and in relationship with him, we can have a relationship together. You got to go through my son. So God, creation points us to God. God points us to Jesus. Well, guess what? Jesus points you to relationship with him. Jesus points you to life change. Jesus points you to discipleship. Jesus points you to this process of giving your life to him. And by the way, that's that process. Every time we read in scripture about somebody giving their life to Jesus, you know the very first thing we see them do? Every single time. I gave my life to Jesus. The very first act of obedience we see is that they're obedient to God through baptism. For some reason, there's like a, a lot of people out there right now in the American church are like, hey, I gave my life to Jesus. I raised my hand. I gave my, I professed. And, and for whatever reason, that was like eight years ago. And you've never taken the initial step of obedience, being baptized. What's that about? Hey, Jesus, I want to do things your way. All right, get baptized. Uh, not that, though. Listen, if you're in this room and you've given your life to Christ, you've put your faith in him, but you've never been obedient to him in that very first step he's called you to do, which is to be baptized by immersion right here. Maybe that's something that God's calling you to do as your what now God moment. Maybe that's what you're supposed to do from this. To realize that you're a man separated from God by sin. And when you go down into the waters, you're dying to your sin nature and you're coming up restored symbolically into new life. Something powerful about baptism. Maybe God's calling you to step into faith for the first time. You're realizing for the first time that you're separated from God because of your sin and you don't want to be separated from God anymore and you want to step into faith for the first time. Listen, I, I, I tell people, we, we take the cover off this baptistry every week because we baptize any Sunday. We baptized four people last service. <laughs> um, I also tell people that we keep the water hot. I learned last service, that's not true today. <laughs> Whew, that's a cold water. Um, we have shorts and flip-flops and towels and shirts and everything someone might, might need to be able to change and get baptized today if they wanted to. And, I would challenge you, if you're in this room and God's calling you to that, don't, that's not something you postpone. I can understand, like, hey, I want to postpone it because my grandma is going to be in town next Sunday. Cool, let's wait for grandma. She'll love it, right? But, but here's what I mean. Like, if God's calling you into this step and there's not a, a legitimate reason to wait till next week, why not take care of it today? So I'm going to pray. I wasn't really planning on doing this. The band's not coming back out to play us some more songs. But if you're like, hey, you know, after everyone dismisses, you want to get baptized today, would you just come and find me? you come find someone with a lanyard and say, hey, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. I need to get baptized. And we'll do that. We'll, right at the beginning of next service. Right now in between services. As people are walking out, we'll baptize you right now. All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for the way that you reveal a lot about who you are. And in order for us to understand who you are, you tell us a lot about who we are. Help us to have a, a, a valid understanding of who we are in light of who you are so that we can better understand our need, our desperate need for Jesus. If there's anybody in this room right now that needs to start that relationship today, would you give them the, the boldness and the courage to say something? That nobody would leave or walk out of these doors apart from a relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. We are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.